Thank you, Pekka, for a kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a great uh, pleasure for me to uh, visit Toronto, at least for an afternoon. And actually, it's much closer to CERN uh, uh, than, than uh, Triumph, so <laughs> I often go through the airport, actually. <clears throat> so today, uh, I will talk about the, uh, the anti-hydrogen uh, experiment that I've been uh, working on for the last uh, almost 20 years. Uh, and, but before that, let me just start with a little introduction about uh, Triumph, and, uh, uh, which pays my salary. So, uh, Triumph is uh, Canada's national lab for nuclear and particle physics, and it's owned and operated by uh, 19 universities, uh, including uh, University of Toronto. So I think Pekka is kind of like my boss, or somebody from this university is kind of like my boss. <coughs> Uh, we have an on-site program uh, for nuclear physics and, and the condensed matter physics and as well as theory group. And in my department, uh, particle physics department, have an off-site program, uh, ATLAS, uh, where many uh, people here are participating. And also a T2K neutrino experiment, as well as an ultra-cold neutron uh, on-site and alpha. So these are the four uh, particle physics priority projects, <coughs> as well as other uh, smaller projects. <coughs> So having uh, said that, uh, today I will uh, describe brief, start with a brief history of uh, antimatter and antihydrogen, and I will spend a little bit of time uh, motivating uh, why we might want to do this kind of uh, experiment. Uh, and then I will describe to you how to make actually antihydrogen atom, and then go into a little bit more detail about uh, the alpha experiment. Uh, and then I'll only briefly touch uh, uh, on the a new experiment to measure gravitational force on antimatter, uh, which we're just currently uh, building at the moment. So just to be clear on what I'm talking about, uh, anti-hydrogen uh, atom uh, is the atomic bound state of a positron and antiproton, and sometimes uh, I call uh, anti-hydrogen H-bar or, or anti-H, and, and antiproton P-bar by uh, convention. So, uh, in late uh, 1920s, uh, Dirac discovered the, uh, or formulated the relativistic form of quantum mechanics. And this uh, predicted uh, negative energy state. And at that time, uh, Heisenberg called this the most miserable chapter in modern physics. I think we may be approaching another more, more, uh, miserable chapter in, in uh, physics right now for various reasons. But <clears throat> anyway, that was then. Uh, so this is Paul Dirac, and this is, a, <laughs> this is the anti Dirac. Uh, a few years later, uh, Anderson discovered uh, uh, anti electrons, or which uh, now we call positrons, in a cosmic ray. And uh, by, look, by bending on this, uh, uh, cosmic ray uh, uh, in the magnetic field, they were able to de deduce that it was actually negative, uh, uh, sorry, positively charged uh, particle of electron mass, about electron mass uh, that they discovered in the uh, cosmic ray. <clears throat> uh, some years later, uh, at the Berkeley lab, uh, antiproton was discovered. And back then, there was no uh, Facebook or Twitter, so I guess they, they kind of communicate in a, in, a, in a chalkboard, I guess, that uh, these people won Nobel Prize. That was 1950s. And some, uh, another 40 years later or so, uh, the relativistic form of antihydrogen has been uh, observed. So this was an old facility uh, called LIA at CERN, where antiproton is circulating. And by collision of a, of a gaseous target, uh, sometimes a positron and, and uh, uh, electron pair was produced, and very occasionally a uh, positron was picked up by uh, antiproton, so they formed a neutral state. So they reported nine events, uh, but they, uh, immediately after, like uh, it, within uh, nanoseconds, they hit the walls and annihilated. So with these fast atoms, you couldn't do, do any uh, uh, precision studies. So that's why CERN uh, decided to uh, construct this uh, new facility dedicated for antimatter research called anti antiproton decelerator in 1999. So this is about time when I <coughs> started uh, this uh, uh, in this field. 
And I'm sure you've seen this many times. Uh, uh, so this is a, a large hadron collider ring with the Geneva Lake and, and Alps. But uh, AD is a tiny dot. The anti uh, proton decelerator facility is a tiny dot in, in, uh, in this uh, big CERN facility. And shown here is uh, inside this AD uh, ring, is, which goes around this uh, building. We have experimental uh, holes. And it started out with uh, uh, three experiments. Uh, now, uh, many uh, experiments are uh, uh, joining, and this is actually a really emerging and flourishing field. And most recently, a base experiment uh, measured the uh, uh, magnetic moment of anti-protons uh, to parts per billion. So some of you might have heard this in, in the news. Uh, I'm gonna, not gonna, and also, the uh, Eric Hessel from uh, uh, York has been involved in the ATRAP uh, experiment. Uh, uh, so, I'm not going to talk uh, any more about any other experiment, but these are really active uh, field. Another thing to point out is the uh, CERN is investing uh, uh, quite a significant amount of resources to upgrade the AD facility. And so, uh, it's called the ELENA, Extra Low Energy Antiphoton Ring. So, this will increase the antiphoton intensity by up to two orders of magnitude, uh, which should be uh, online for physics in 2021. So, these are exciting uh, time to be in this field. Okay, so that's a bit of history and, and uh, where we are now. Uh, but let me now turn into uh, motivations. Why do we want to study uh, anti-hydrogen? So there, there, are, there are a number of different reasons uh, why, we, why we study anti-hydrogen. And uh, uh, one is, uh, I think it's kind of obvious, that uh, the experimental. So we just created a, a new, uh, uh, so, so we know, uh, a lot of, about the matter sector uh, of our universe, and we just created a new sort of element uh, with the atomic number m minus one <coughs> in some sense. So, so one, you know, once you have a new system, you really want to study uh, its property, uh, just as an experimentalist, you know, how, how you know, these things behave in, in a different way <coughs> and, and compared to hydrogen. Uh, and of course, uh, you heard uh, many times about the uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, and uh, so this is uh, one of the big uh, uh, issues uh, in modern physics. Uh, but uh, what I think most important uh, reason why we should study anti-hydrogen is about the its fundamental symmetry. Uh, in particular, uh, charge parity, uh, time reversal, uh, and uh, uh, equivalence principle, which I'll describe in a bit. <clears throat> so in order to discuss this, I want to just step back a bit and uh, ask a uh, 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 little bit of a, uh, a fundamental question. So, which is this. What is particle physics? So, who teaches particle physics course here? Okay. <laughs> so, students uh, of Bob uh, and David should know the answer to this, right? Uh, so, of course, there's many answers to this, but... Uh, one answer uh, by Grossman, uh, this is a Cornell theorist, is particle physics is about uh, answering this question. What is the uh, fundamental Lagrangian uh, of nature? Now, uh, to this question, I will have a very simple answer, <clears throat> uh, which is a standard model, uh, including uh, at least one Higgs, and this works very well, and it's, it's hard to lives even five years uh, since the Higgs discovery. And you know, now you can buy this uh, mug on the standard model for 12 Swiss francs in a certain souvenir store, uh, which describes the entire universe. Uh, however, you probably have heard that there are many people complain about standard model. There are many incompleteness, <clears throat> which I will not go into detail, but, but uh, we expected some new physics, and, and it's not there. So it, it, it pops in the sort of, uh, we're kind of reaching a sort of paradigm uh, shift or, or need for that, uh, possibly. So it seems to be a, a good time to ask uh, this another question. Are we asking the right question? In other words, uh, it, it, what's the Lagrangian of nature? Is this really a uh, right question to ask? The implicit th in this question is that a, as a quantum field theory is a, a correct description of nature. And this is what actually uh, uh, anti hydrogen uh, is, is testing uh, because uh, uh, the CPT uh, 
theorem uh, is uh, symmetry is a fundamental property of quantum field theory, <coughs> which predicts the atomic spectrum of hydrogen and antihydrogen has to be exactly the same. And uh, uh, the, in a similar manner, uh, equivalence principle uh, is a fundamental prop, uh, assumption in general relativity, and uh, it, uh, it says that uh, uh, antihydrogen and uh, hydrogen uh, should uh, f f uh, experience free fall uh, in exactly the same way. <clears throat> uh, if we find any difference uh, in, uh, for example, in a diff uh, uh, spectra of hydrogen or antihydrogen, or the gravitational f uh, interaction of a hydrogen or antihydrogen, <clears throat> This will really uh, uh, force a radical change in the way we look at the, uh, uh, we understand the physics because you have to basically break either quantum field theory or, or uh, general relativity. <clears throat> so of course, the, I mean, these are well-established theories. Uh, so the probability of, of us finding something this big is, is, is very small. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's, uh, as an experimentalist, I think it's important to check. And where do you check when you don't know uh, where to check? It is, uh, it's like when you lost, lost a key in the darkness, you look under the uh, lamp post. So this is a, a, an example <coughs> of a sort of lamp post science, uh, if you will. And, uh, and this, uh, this is a lamp post because uh, we uh, 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 think we can make a very high precision measurement comparison of a hydrogen and antihydrogen uh, eventually. OK, so that's a, a little bit of convoluted uh, motivation that, 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 uh, that I like to tell people about why uh, we study uh, antihydrogen. <clears throat> so now I'll go into the how we, we make antihydrogen. <clears throat> so uh, after the 80s started in, in late 1990s, uh, after several years of uh, our work, uh, uh, we've been able to produce uh, uh, slow-moving antihydrogen. So this uh, we did by uh, combining uh, uh, large amount of antiprotons uh, together with large amount of positrons, which are held uh, in vacuum. Uh, and, and antiprotons uh, we obtain from the AD, and it's produced in a, uh, a high energy collision of a proton with a target. So you need uh, some 12 order of, ma of magnitude of uh, uh, deceleration and cooling. The positron uh, is very easier because you can buy a source uh, 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 from a company. And so you only have to uh, decelerate about uh, uh, nine order of magnitude uh, in order to uh, make them cold enough to, to, be combined, to combine and form antihydrogen. <clears throat> but this side really was pioneered by Jerry Gabriels, uh, who's been at Harvard for a long time. And the positron, uh, nowadays, everybody uses a, a scheme developed by Cliff Circle at, at San Diego. Uh, Athena experiment they introduced the uh, vertex detector to, to detect these uh, 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 annihilation of antihydrogen, uh, which I'll show uh, display in a minute. So this was a, a particle uh, detection capability is something uh, that we have had as a unique capability among our competing experiments. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about uh, how we uh, 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 trap uh, antiparticles. <clears throat> so Obviously, uh, antiparticle hit, you know, hits the walls uh, and annihilates. So you have to suspend uh, them in, in vacuum. And generally, to, to suspend a particle in a vacuum, uh, uh, you need at, uh, at least two uh, uh, things. One is a, a confining force. When, when an atom or, or, or ion try to hit the wall, you have to push it back, uh, obviously. And the, but the other uh, thing you need is a loading mechanism. Uh, so if you, in a conservative system, you have a well. Uh, any particle that has uh, enough kinetic energy to go into that well will just get gets out. So you need some sort of trick in order to uh, uh, trap antihydrogen in, in, a confined, in, in, in a confined space. <clears throat> uh, trapping charged particles is uh, quite easy. Uh, we use uh, this device called penning trap. So here uh, we have a strong magnetic field along the axis. So for example, uh, electrons uh, are bound uh, tightly to the uh, cyclotron orbit uh, along this uh, magnetic field. But if you just have that, then the electron can uh, leak out at the, uh, both uh, uh, sides. So you plug these uh, uh, edges by electrostatic uh, potential. So this is a, a, a principle of a penning trap. And you can uh, trap uh, uh, up to several uh, uh, a charged particles of, of several uh, keV, uh, uh, kilo electron volt in energy. Uh, it's much harder to trap uh, neutral particles, obviously, and we use uh, what's called magnetic trap. I'll describe a little this in more detail, but the, 
difficulty here is really the deep depths of the, of the uh, trap is very shallow. Uh, and then in, in terms of loading, uh, we use uh, different kinds of loading trick. One is uh, dissipative, so you actually cause a friction. So you, when particle goes in, you slow it down inside your trap, and then out of, uh, the uh, particles trap. For example, this is how we trap positrons uh, using a buffer gas. Uh, another mechanism is dynamical. So you, uh, you send in a bunch of, a uh, uh, short bunch of antiphotons, uh, and then you open the uh, well, this uh, electrostatic well, short period of time. Antiphoton bounces back, and then before it comes back, you close the well. So that's an example of dynamical uh, trapping. And, and in fact, uh, these particle manipulation is, is really non-trivial, and we spend much of uh, uh, our beam time uh, trying to learn how to manipulate uh, particles without the blowing these things up and, and losing. Uh, and it's so easy to lose these particles if you screw up uh, your operation. Uh, yet another uh, new thing uh, for us was uh, uh, people have been using a pinning trap and a neutral trap for a long time, but a, a combination of these things uh, has never really been done. So, so this is another technical challenge we have to overcome. <clears throat> But after all this, uh, uh, in Athena, we've been able to uh, uh, trap antihydrogen. So this is an a, a event display where antihydrogen is produced and they're hitting the wall, which is not shown. And then uh, annihilation uh, is, is detected by this uh, particle tracking uh, detector. Uh, this was uh, 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 featured in, in a, a cover uh, of an uh, undergrad textbook. Uh, so you can actually buy this uh, textbook for about 100 bucks uh, in Amazon. <laughs> So that was a Athena experiment, the previous experiment that, that I worked on. Now, Athena produced a, a large quantity of a cold antihydrogen, so antihydrogen uh, slowly moving. But the, these uh, antihydrogen were not uh, uh, confined. They just drifted towards wall and annihilated and died eventually. <clears throat> so after uh, Athena, or, or while we were finishing up Athena, uh, we developed a new experiment uh, in order to really trap confined antihydrogen and study its property precisely. Uh, and so I actually thought long and hard about uh, the name of this, uh, collab uh, this new experiment. <coughs> uh, as you notice in this uh, uh, particle physics experiment, I don't know who started it, but, but uh, it used to be just numbers, uh, but uh, everybody has a name. Uh, so my su I original suggestion was uh, uh, AL, <laughs> Antihydrogen Laser Experiment. I even had a, 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 a logo. I mean, this is my favorite Ontario beer. I mean, it's hard to get this in BC for some reason anymore. Anyway, it's entirely just trapped in this. Uh, but this suggestion uh, was uh, uh, rejected by my uh, colleagues. So, so my uh, next suggestion was uh, alpha, anti-hydrogen laser physics apparatus. So that, that's how the uh, name came about in 2005. Uh, I had to apologize for a long time because we haven't done laser, had not done laser experiments for many years. We been, have been doing a lot of other stuff, microwave experiment, uh, some sort of gravity te uh, tests and the charge neutrality test. But only recently, only uh, uh, several months ago that we managed to do laser experiments. So now finally we can really call this uh, alpha without apologizing. <clears throat> so, the, uh, so this is a list of collaborations. So we have carry over uh, from a previous Athena experiment and the new collaborators and then a significant uh, a Canadian uh, group. And uh, I'm actually making a Canadian group bigger than uh, we actually are by using slightly bigger fonts. <coughs> <That's> cheating. <coughs> but actually, we're about 40% uh, of the collaboration, and uh, there are a number of uh, students and, and uh, uh, postdocs that are highlighted here who works very hard in experiment. Uh, but it's a really great, great the team effort, uh, international and interdisciplinary experiment. <coughs> so, so how do we uh, trap anti neutral anti-hydrogen? Uh, so, Okay, so we just first uh, produce again antihydrogen like we did in Athena, mix uh, protons, uh, antiprotons and uh, positrons. And then we just superimpose the uh, uh, a magnetic trap. And magnetic trap works uh, uh, from the interaction of a magnetic moment and, and, and a B field. So this just wind some coils around. So it sounds pretty easy. And in fact, uh, uh, well, th uh, this is actually a, a little bit more uh, cartoon version of a uh, uh, what's going on. So the, uh, uh, this is uh, what's known as the Rabi diagram, uh, anti-hydrogen, uh, sorry, or hydrogen energy diagram in a, in a strong magnetic field. And we work around one Tesla. So at, at this strong uh, uh, field, uh, essentially uh, 
the, its uh, its position and, and, uh, and proton spins are uh, uh, decoupled. So these two hyperfine states are, are trappable, and these two hyperfine states are, are not trappable. <coughs> Uh, uh, and so by having, uh, uh, these are trappable by having a magnetic field minimum in the center. So here's the anima animation of how, how uh, it works. So the uh, antihydrogen is, is like a little bar magnet uh, with, 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 with a magnetic moment. And, uh, and because of the configuration of magnetic field that we produce, uh, when you uh, tr try to hit the wall, it's pushed, it's pushed back by this uh, magnetic potential. So this is how uh, we, uh, would trap antihydrogen. Unfortunately, uh, this, this four magnetic force is very weak, so we really need to uh, call this uh, atom that is possible. And just in order to quantify a little bit of this challenge uh, uh, that we had a little bit more, uh, so there are different character, characteristic energy scale in, in, in the experiment. One is uh, plasma energy. <clears throat> so in order to make antihydrogen, you have to have a, a lot of uh, antihydrogen, uh, antiprotons and positrons. And, they, they, and they, then they have a lot of potential energy known as a space charge. And uh, it, typically, you have an order of 10 volts, 10 electron volts of space charge in this plasma that we trap. And on the other hand, the neutral trap is, is maximum of tens of uh, uh, microelectron volts. So it really, uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a five order of magnitude difference in the energy scale of the problem that we have to deal with uh, in order to trap antihydrogen. Uh, hence, we need a precise control of this uh, uh, trapped uh, plasma a large number of uh, uh, charged particles. Co compared to that, actually, uh, our original antihydrogen production was much easier, uh, partly because atomic energy scale and the plasma space energy scale is similar. So no matter how badly you mix positron and antiprotons, you, s you end up with some, some atoms. But those, those atoms are typically too hot to be trapped. Uh, in, a, in order to tra uh, produce a uh, cold atom, we, we had to work really hard. And also because of this discrepancy in energy scale, we, we knew uh, that uh, our event rate for the trapping is gonna be uh, very low. Uh, and so, so that's why uh, we uh, spent significant of effort, uh, amount of effort to uh, develop uh, uh, the uh, sophisticated uh, annihilation detector. So, so this is, uh, uh, it, for example, in this case, is a, a, a silicon detector uh, with almost a square meter of area, uh, which is a, a, a quite a bit of a, a <clears throat> effort. But in the end, this position uh, sensitivity turned out to be very important, and, and, it, and I repeatedly come back to this position sen uh, sen uh, sensitivity by this uh, tracking detector in, in this talk. <clears throat> Uh, so they, we started out in, uh, uh, our uh, physics in 2006, and, and we had to reinvent all these kind of techniques that, that uh, people don't u uh, use in, in normal matter atoms or ions. And uh, uh, I can't go through any the, the, in any detail, but I just expect to, except to highlight this uh, one of them, which is uh, uh, evaporative cooling uh, of, of antipotons. And evaporative cooling is uh, uh, widely used in uh, cold atom physics, and it's, it's a, how your cup of coffee uh, cools down. You know, the high energy, a more higher energy molecule preferentially uh, is, is evaporated, uh, and leaving the, uh, the, the average temperature of your liquid uh, colder than before. <coughs> and so we did we did do this uh, with the antiproton cloud. So basically, uh, letting a, a antipot hot antiproton evaporate and then ending up with a uh, much colder sample. Now this was the first time that is, is evaporative cooling was done for cold charged particles, let alone antimatter particles. <clears throat> so this is just an example of the thing that we had to develop over the uh, course of years in order to do fine control uh, of the trapped particles. And with, with a combination of this, I'm just gonna show you a little animation of, of how this all <coughs> fits in. <coughs> So this is animation made by UK colleagues. <clears throat> so shown here is outside uh, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, three layers of a silicon, uh, double-sided silicon uh, uh, tracking detector. Uh, and the whole thing is, is fit into one Tesla solar field, which is not shown. And if you peel off the detector, uh, uh, these are the, uh, uh, in the uh, magnets that traps, that produces this magnetic field to push back the, the atom from the wall. And, and we typically, uh, so these are uh, superconducting magnet uh, in, uh, 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 immersed in a liquid helium held at a four Kelvin. And we typically use uh, of order 1,000 amps. So these, these are sort of a, you know, high, the, as much current we can put in the, these, these uh, uh, cryogenic system. 
<coughs> and, and so, so we try to make the highest, deepest uh, neutral trap uh, possible. And if you peel off these uh, uh, trap walls, inside here is the penning trap electrodes. So these, now we're in an ultra high vacuum re region. And these electrodes uh, produce, provides an electrostatic wall for the penning trap, which is used to trap antipotons and the positrons, uh, which is needed to, to uh, uh, produce antigen in the first place. So here, uh, anti anti uh, positrons trapped and, uh, and antipotons trapped. And we gently mix antipotons and a positron. And this gently took really, really uh, a lot of uh, learning. Uh, because it, as I say, it's easy to just, just blow things up very quickly. So, uh, uh, so after all this uh, uh, learning, uh, uh, if you succeed, then you can actually uh, produce an antigen atom. And, and we think antigen is formed in the first known as three body uh, recombination where uh, 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 spectator uh, positron uh, carries out the extra momentum and the energy. <coughs> so the, even with all this uh, antigen that are formed are uh, still way too hot. So we typically make uh, around 10,000 antigen and uh, initially we tr used to tr trap like a, a, a half antigen uh, uh, per, per this trial. We, we show antihydrogen is, is uh, trapped. Uh, also here is, is, is a, uh, so that this, if, if one antihydrogen is trapped, it, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of swimming inside this uh, uh, magnetic potential. And we're gonna show that antihydrogen is trapped by, by shutting down this magnet. It's actually physically quench this sparkling magnet to, uh, uh, to release antihydrogen as, as uh, quickly as possible. And when you do that, uh, it, oops. Yeah, so when, when you uh, uh, turn off the uh, magnetic trap, antennas release, drift towards the wall, and hit, uh, hit the walls, and then produce these uh, uh, high energy particles, uh, which we track uh, from the uh, in uh, vertex uh, detector. <clears throat> so this is how we uh, uh, detect antigen schematically. Uh, so this uh, uh, was a topic of uh, uh, one of my student thesis and uh, of course, we were looking at very few rare events initially, so we had to worry the, about the background for this kind of event. <laughs> and uh, and uh, one major background is cosmic ray. So this is a, a, a front view, top view of uh, uh, our experiment. So this is a trap walls where antihydrogen could, could hit and annihilate. So we all detect only uh, antipotons. So in, in this case, antipoton hits the wall going to three pions, which are detected with a silicon detector. A cosmic ray uh, looks more like a straight. So using uh, this topology uh, difference, uh, we've been able to uh, show that the, the cosmic uh, background is, is negligible <clears throat> beyond five sigma. <coughs> and in 2009, when we tried this, uh, 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 this uh, trial uh, for about 200 times, we saw uh, six uh, candidate events uh, after blind analysis. Uh, now, as I said, this, uh, uh, we had a statistical significance to uh, reject cosmic, but we were not able to uh, reject one uh, important uh, possible background, uh, which is uh, very unlikely according to simulation, but it was, was nonetheless uh, uh, seemed possible. So that was a mirror trapping of bare antiprotons. So remember, we only detect uh, antiprotons, not positrons. So if any bare antiprotons are, are, are left in the trap, uh, and due to the informogenesis magnetic field, the, uh, due to the mirror effect, these, these antipotons could be uh, uh, trapped. Then we could not be, uh, rule out this possibility. <clears throat> uh, so at this point, we did not claim an antigen trapping. Again, simulation uh, indicated this was a, a ver a very unlikely. And some people accused us that we were just being too conservative. What's, what's, what's the big deal with, uh, about uh, trapping? few atoms, but, but uh, okay, I think we, were right, we did the right thing by being uh, conservative. Uh, so the year after, uh, we improved that trap, uh, and uh, uh, we saw uh, uh, 38 events out of a 30, uh, 300 trial. But more importantly, uh, we came up with the uh, uh, new control measurement by basically, so this is a retrospect, very simple. So I was, I was, I was kind of a, uh, disappointed about myself, why, why not I didn't think of it sooner. Uh, when I think about this. 
So it's basically, you, uh, the, the trick is just apply electric field to deflect uh, uh, any charged particles. So if it's neutral, it's not affected, uh, uh, which is what you want. Or if it's charged trap uh, background, then it's deflected by electric field. <clears throat> so this really convinced us that we're really seeing the neutral anti-hydrogen hitting the wall. Uh, uh, and so we went, uh, uh, and we announced that anti-hydrogen is really trapped. And here, it's, we're uh, illegally opening a, a champagne in, in a control room. Uh, sorry, oh, I guess I'm ta being taped, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, and then, so this was uh, uh, some, uh, uh, drew some interest. And uh, preparing this part of the talk, I, I just remembered that uh, in 2009, 2010, so I was in charge of the, look, doing analysis at CERN. And you know, I actually really didn't know how to do this kind of analysis. I was just searching on the web Okay, how do, how do we do this, this kind of stuff? And I accidentally came across with, the, with this paper uh, from Pekka, which was written in, in 2002. And this is really great uh, uh, reference. So, so I actually learned all the statistical uh, uh, of you know, how to do uh, uh, p-value and stuff like that from, uh, from, from uh, Pekka's paper. <coughs> uh, and I must have done uh, my statistics uh, correct because uh, the, the cartoonist also Accounted that uh, the 38 atoms uh, uh, had been detected. So, <laughs> so my 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 my, my uh, statistic was verified uh, independently. <laughs> okay, so the initially uh, our initial trapping was only for fractional seconds. We we didn't want a uh, chance of losing any uh, atoms that are so few that are trapping. To, so so we almost immediately trapped. We released it. Uh, but subsequently, we've been able to extend uh, uh, anti-hydrogen trapping time uh, to as long as 1,000 seconds or perhaps 2,000 seconds. So this, so this is what I'm showing here is the number of anti-hydrogen trapped trap as a, uh, a function of a confinement time. And here, there's this variation of probably just the systematics. But uh, we saw no evidence that anti-hydrogen is, is, is really uh, uh, being lost. Uh, so this actually was really a game changer. You know, we've, we've been trying to do this device uh, experiment with a sort of fraction of a trapping time. We really didn't know how long we can trap an, an anti-hydrogen. But now you have a uh, you know, thousand second uh, 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 perhaps hours uh, to, to, to play with uh, to, and to interrogate uh, uh, these anti-hydrogen atoms. Uh, <clears throat> so with this, uh, we actually started, uh, 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 succeeded in doing a first measurement uh, with a microwave. So this is a Canadian effort, really. The uh, UBC, uh, uh, Walter Hardy from UBC, and the, uh, Mike Hayden from SFU led this measurement. <coughs> and he, let me just quickly explain what, what, I, what we did. So as I said, antihydrogens are trapped in these two hyperfine states. And, and if you send a microwave uh, uh, in resonance with these transitions, you can actually flip the uh, positron spin from trappable states to, to non-trappable state. So if, you, so if this transition takes place, then antihydrogen is expelled uh, from the wall. So in this experiment, we typically trap uh, about, uh, on average, 0.4 antihydrogen atom uh, every 20 minutes of trial. Uh, and then we irradiate uh, a microwave to drive this transition, and then look for annihilation. And after all this uh, uh, long, uh, uh, well, to make long story short, we, we, we were able to observe, in coincidence with microwave injection, which is at, the, at, the, at zero, this clear uh, annihilation signal. Uh, if the uh, microwave is on resonance, and if off resonance, you see a little count. So th from this, uh, we claim that we actually saw the first uh, uh, quantum transition uh, in, in antimatter atoms. So as a, as a spectroscopy, this is a very low precision, 10 to minus three level. But it, this experiment really demonstrated that, that even uh, with a single anti-atom at a time, or in fact 0.4 anti-atom at a time, you can actually do some sort of a, a measurement. And again, uh, an annihilation detector with a, with a high uh, background rejection of, uh, uh, capability uh, has been the key for this. <clears throat> uh, since then, <laughs> we've been doing a lot of fun, uh, and uh, uh, so I mentioned these all these three. <clears throat> but. Uh, uh, Eventually, uh, well, in fact, quickly, uh, we realized that, okay, uh, uh, we really need to uh, make a new device. So, uh, so, so we, we uh, oh, it's, it's A, no, it's, a is missing, but it's Alpha 2 device was, was uh, constructed uh, during a certain shutdown. And we've been, in, a, in the past uh, couple of years, we've been able to uh, uh, 
do some uh, uh, farm measurement. <coughs> and uh, so let me just uh, mostly focus on the, on, on the uh, uh, laser experiment uh, <coughs> that was published uh, uh, in January this year. <coughs> so, so, the, so the measurement we did is a 1S to 2S, uh, two photon spectroscopy. So, so by using the uh, counter-propagating uh, photons to drive 1S to 2S uh, uh, transition, uh, Doppler effect cancels to first order. So this is a really the uh, uh, sort of a, a lamp post, uh, at least one of the lamp posts in, in intelligent physics, because in matter sector, the precision uh, is so tremendous. So this is a, a hydrogen spectroscopy uh, as shown as a function of a year in a log scale, and it's been accelerating uh, even in log scale, the, the, the improvement in precision, until Ted Hench won Nobel Prize around 2005, so it's kind of... <laughs> I stopped a little bit, but they're still making uh, the, the gradual uh, uh, progress. And now it's about uh, parts per 10 to minus uh, uh, 15 level. <laughs> so we want to compare this transition uh, with, with anti-hydrogen. Uh, anti and in order, in order to do this, we have to build a new apparatus, apparatus because our original apparatus didn't have a, a laser access, and we also wanted to improve my, uh, my magnetic field uh, 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 uniformity and, and other features. So this is a, is a, was a big effort. Uh, we built a, a whole cryostat for the trap at Triumph. And uh, uh, shown here, it's a little bit hard to see. But so, so outside is a solenoid. And the inside is a de detector and trap. And the laser is a window to go through this uh, uh, to, to have a, a counter-propagating laser uh, to shoot uh, a trapped antigen atom. <clears throat> now, these experiments really so hard. Uh, that uh, we I mean, tried some uh, a number of times, but they weren't really uh, successful. But the really breakthrough uh, came when uh, we were able to uh, improve uh, uh, trapping efficiency. <clears throat> so the uh, so here I'm plotting as a year uh, and the number of intelligent trap, both uh, per trial and per hour. So we both in, in, increase the uh, per trial number and as well as efficiency uh, duty cycle. So typically, previously it took 20 to 30 minutes to do one uh, cycle, but they can do it in four, four, four minutes now. So as a result, uh, we've been able to uh, increase the number of hydrogen drastically dramatically. And another thing uh, that we developed uh, uh, recently was uh, a process called stacking. So here, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process of repeated loading. So you, you make antihydrogen in a trap, and without uh, destroying it, you, you keep making antihydrogen. So here it's showing it uh, from uh, uh, five, uh, five uh, repeated, five stacking. Uh, and this is only possible because antihydrogen lifetime in a trap is so long. <laughs> so when I gave a, a talk uh, uh, in, in uh, this summer, I said something like, okay, preliminary uh, video people, uh, <coughs> the, uh, if you're watching the video, but the spray is about 100 atoms trapped. Uh, but just a week ago or so, we trapped almost 1,000. Again, it's preliminary. But so by here, by stacking 50 cycles. So for three hours, you just keep adding antihydrogen. And the antipoton comes every two minutes. You have to cool down and stuff like that. So every four minutes, you can keep adding. So, 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 so right now, so, so we have, I mean, and remember, we started out with a 0.01 atom per, uh, per trial. And so, so now, I mean, several order of magnitude increase. For this, you can do a lot of stuff that you couldn't uh, imagine before, which, which, one of which is this laser experiment. <clears throat> so here, again, schematically, laser is introduced into the uh, trapped atom, and it would drive one to two S state with a two, uh, counter two, 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 uh, uh, 43 nanometer photons. And then once uh, atom is excited to two S state, uh, it's destroyed most likely by another uh, 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 photon. Uh, it's, uh, the atom is ionized. So in this uh, uh, experiment, uh, we trap typically 14 hours per cycle, uh, and then uh, we injected laser for 600 seconds, uh, either on, on resonance or another, another one uh, off resonance. Uh, and if antihydrogen is destroyed by resonant transition, uh, at the end of the run, uh, you have a le less antihydrogen one hand. So that's a disappearance mode that, I, that we analyzed. And also, during a laser irradiation, 
you see the uh, uh, loss of antihydrogen, so, so, which is uh, detected here. So here, uh, I'm showing the uh, annihilation dis position distribution as a function of actual uh, position. Zero is the center of the trap. Uh, and if you look at the, at the blue histogram, uh, on resonance, you seem to see a little bit more counts than no resonance, but this is not convincing. But when you apply a multivariate analysis, uh, so this is a, a, a type of machine learning uh, uh, algorithm, you really clearly pick out the, this uh, uh, signal. So we're really doing a, a, a sort of so cutting edge uh, particle physics analysis uh, that are applied to antihydrogen physics that are extremely uh, powerful. <clears throat> so with this, uh, uh, we reported the first laser spectroscopy of antihydrogen. And uh, this is really, I mean, I mean this, it, it's hard to overstress the importance of this measurement. The whole AD was really built for this. This is what we've been promising for like nearly 20 years that we're gonna do. So this is only the, the first measurement, this is an initial measurement, but, but it's still the fact that we can do this was really, really a, a, a significant uh, uh, milestone. And a, a competitor uh, from another experiment really uh, uh, told me that uh, it's a really dream come for, true for the entire field. <clears throat> so now, uh, with this really initial demonstration experiment, we know by in 10 digit this uh, frequency of a, of a transition. Now, of course, hydrogen is known to 14 to 15 digits uh, so it, it's a few more to go there, but, but it's really we're getting into the real uh, uh, precision uh, uh, regime. And already at this precision, the internal structure, so, so, so uh, of, uh, the finite size of uh, antipoton is, is becoming important. So we have sensitivity to the TH radius of antipoton at 20% level already. And, and so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to say something about the uh, proton charge radius uh, uh, in, uh, from an antipoton side uh, uh, in, in a few, uh, within a few years. <clears throat> now, uh, right now, with, with these series of uh, uh, experiments, we're actually doing a line shape. So this is on-off measurement. So we, we did a measurement on, on all resonance and a detuned by uh, uh, 400 kilohertz. Uh, we're actually making a line shape measurement. So this really should uh, give us a, a least order of magnitude or maybe two improvement in a precision. At the same time, we also have taken the data to improve microbe uh, hyperfine transition, uh, uh, again, uh, by uh, uh, more than order of magnitude. <clears throat> but uh, one thing I really want to uh, tell you about is what we're doing right now as we speak. So, and I didn't, didn't have an internet, so I, didn't know, I don't know the exact uh, uh, the result of the, what we're doing right now at CERN <clears throat> yet. <clears throat> but uh, what, as we speak, we're trying to drive, for the first time, uh, one is to two P transition. So this is a transition from one is to two P. Now, uh, this is a, one of the most fundamental transition in, in a, a fundamental atomic transition in the entire universe. I mean, this is a, uh, the cosmic microwave uh, uh, that, that you see uh, for hydrogen uh, that are now uh, uh, Doppler shifted to, to three Kelvin or so. Uh, but not only this sort of uh, important fundamentally, uh, this, this uh, uh, transition is useful because you can drive a laser cooling. By, by, having, by driving this transition, you can cool antihydrogen atom to, to a very cold temperature and, 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 and prepare a dense uh, sample. And, and so, so that's why I'm very excited about this measurement. Uh, uh, however, this uh, laser is very difficult. Uh, this is a uh, extremely short wavelengths, uh, so you cannot buy these lasers. You have to uh, uh, produce uh, uh, on your own. And, and my colleague from UBC, Takamomose from UBC, been developing this for the last several years. Uh, and, uh, uh, but finally, I think we have enough power uh, uh, this week. Uh, we tried last week, it didn't work. But this week, I, I, I think we have enough power. So the experiment we're doing right now uh, is, is something like this. So we trap antihydrogen atom. Now, now so we stack something like uh, 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 20 or 30 stacks. So that, that gives us a, a order of 300 to 400 atoms uh, instead of point, 0 0.4 atoms, remember, that we, we did the first measurement. And then we irradiate uh, this uh, uh, 121, also called the Lyman alpha laser, for, about, for two hours uh, uh, after the, the, the preparation. And then look for annihilation in coincidence. So this is a pulse laser. Uh, so when the uh, laser happens, if transition occurs, some of the time uh, it de excites into the states and the uh, atoms kicked out from the uh, uh, trap. So you look in coincidence with the laser pulses, the annihilation signal. 
So this is the reason why I have to cut short my visit uh, here and I have to fly back to uh, CERN, which I apologize uh, this evening. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so in the last few minutes, uh, I want to talk about the, uh, uh, a feature, which is the, uh, uh, a project uh, called Alpha-G, uh, which is to measure gravitational force on antimatter. And, uh, <clears throat> You know, the force of gravity is so weak compared to any other force that we know. That I, so I've been even scared of thinking about the gravity measurement uh, uh, for a long time. It just seems so hard uh, until uh, this uh, paper. So this uh, paper I got to write that, uh, uh, was that, uh, okay, as soon as we saw this uh, long time confinement, uh, we realized that, okay, with laser cooling, uh, you can actually st start to do a gravity measurement. <clears throat> So this, uh, uh, so a few years ago, we started thinking about uh, how to do uh, this uh, kind of experiment. <clears throat> and basically, uh, there are many uh, indirect constraints uh, uh, that uh, antimatter has to fall uh, to, to Earth as the same gravitational force as ma matter. Uh, for example, from the uh, many fifth force searches, the equivalence principle test uh, of matter. Uh, but, I, so, but it, these are indirect, I would say. So in the end, it's an experimental question where you really, uh, uh, this is true. And, and nobody really directly have seen antimatter fall. So, so we really want to be the first to see antimatter fall <coughs> to Earth. Uh, and so what we do uh, is we try, so, so we're building a vertical trap. Uh, and then antihydrogen, the gas of antihydrogen, uh, which is, uh, you know, maybe 10 or uh, uh, 100 atoms, well, gravitation is sag due to the force of gravity. And, and then, uh, and they, by using a, a position sensitive detector, we should be able to see uh, whether it's falling down or falling up. Uh, and uh, uh, now, I should note that, uh, uh, again, so position sensitive detector is essential, and, and laser cooling is important. And with, in normal cold atom, people do this kind of thing uh, uh, to very high precision. Schematic uh, uh, of our experiments looks like this. So this is obviously not the scale, but the, the whole thing is actually now about three meter, uh, 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 the external solenoid. And then inside uh, this, uh, we have a trap here, uh, which is divided into one, uh, two regions. The bottom region is the same as our alpha apparatus now. So here we, we produce antihydrogen trap and then cool. And then we move the antihydrogen to this measurement region uh, and then uh, do the do science. Uh, there, and uh, uh, we've been able to get the major CFI funding for this experiment. <clears throat> uh, at Triumph, uh, we're, we're constructing the uh, time projection chamber, and for the uh, various uh, uh, reasons, uh, we had to uh, so drift uh, charges uh, perpendicular to magnetic field. So, so this is a uh, uh, this is for expert, but this is a little bit unusual configuration of a, a radio uh, drift uh, TPC. And we're the prototype, well, in fact, we're actually building full, uh, full detector and testing right now, Triumph. <clears throat> uh, just quickly, so the experiment will, will look kind of like this. Uh, it's, a, it's a three meter uh, solenoid inside which we have a trap. And oh, it's hard to see in here. <laughs> but, and there are many different ways of actually uh, uh, showing something is dropping, you know, I mean, whether you throw it a, Throw it up, or, 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 or just uh, release it. Or, I mean, there are different kinds you could do. But one uh, uh, simplest thing uh, is to trap antihydrogen, for example, in this region, and then just uh, uh, really, uh, slowly uh, uh, ramp down the uh, magnetic uh, trap. And because of gravitational force, uh, you, you get more counts at the bottom than top. And uh, you still get some uh, counts in top because thermal energy is still quite high. Uh, but, the, but the, uh, by do, ramping down slowly, you can actually uh, cool, uh, you can do a bit of cooling. So that up and down ratio uh, will be uh, much more, pro uh, pro become more prominent. Uh, we're very busy um, putting together this experiment uh, and we have a crazy schedule of trying to commission this uh, before a shutdown uh, in 2019 and hopefully do a first measurement if uh, lucky. Uh, finally, a uh, bit about the far into future. So, probably in my opinion, a future uh, for this kind of field is, is atomic fountain. 
So this is a Jiedo, uh, is a, a water fountain in, in Geneva. And I want to do something like this <coughs> with the anti-hydrogen atom. Uh, specifically, uh, you can create a configuration where you launch uh, one atom and then uh, split its wave function into two. Uh, and then uh, these two uh, wave functions uh, uh, will travel uh, different, uh, few different gravitational potential, and then they can be made combined <coughs> using these laser pulses. And if, from, uh, from this uh, interference, uh, the phase of, of, of this interference is proportional to the uh, gravitational force, or in fact any other weak for any, any other force uh, uh, that, uh, or, or any other potential difference that, that these two atoms uh, feel. And this is a very powerful measurement because it's a relative measurement. You don't really know, need to know initial condition. Uh, always you want to do relative measurement as possible. So, so, so there's some specific proposal to how to make fountain. But these are very difficult, uh, so we're not going to be able to do it immediately. But these are something in the future that we like to do, uh, anti-atomic interferometry. <clears throat> so with this, uh, let me uh, conclude. Uh, I hope... Uh, I try to address some of the fundamental questions uh, that uh, 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 anti-hydrogen uh, will address. Uh, and 12 or 13 years since the beginning of Alpha, uh, after a lot of a development, technical development, we have finally entered the precision physics era. So we're now looking at the latest spectroscopy at Taurus, 10 MS 12 level, microwave hyperfine spectroscopy uh, to uh, the level of uh, 10 kilohertz. I didn't have time to mention, but the charge neutrality of anti-hydrogen is another pet project uh, of mine, uh, which is a side measurement, uh, but could approach 10 to minus 10. We, we already done 10 to minus 9. And then, as we speak, we're trying uh, one is the 2P transition, the most, one of the most fundamental atomic transition uh, in the whole universe. <clears throat> we're, we're developing a, a gravitational uh, a measurement, uh, hopefully to start next year. And as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, CERN's upgrading the AD into this new machine, Elena, uh, which is uh, uh, under construction. So it's really an exciting time uh, for, for us uh, with all this development. I just want to close my uh, uh, talk by quoting uh, Dan Kleppner, who's a, a, a prominent atomic physicist from MIT. <coughs> uh, he said this. Uh, in uh, uh, Munich Intelligence Workshop in 1992. So that's like uh, 25 years ago. So he said in 1992, in the past six years, creation of intelligence has advanced from the totally visionary to the very, very difficult. <laughs> so I think uh, real precision measurement and a gravity uh, uh, physics when that was intelligent is finally moving from a, a totally visionary to very, very difficult. So I'd like to end with uh, acknowledging all the students uh, that are working hard, and, and they are uh, happy to see that they are acknowledged uh, in, in uh, various media for their work. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so lifetime is about one eighth of a second, uh, so 120, 130 milliseconds. So, so, so they, they, they're, they're quite long. So, in fact, that's why the, uh, that transition is, is, is very narrow. You know. <coughs> uh, and yes, lamp shift is one thing uh, we're looking into. Uh, but the uh, laser spectroscopy may give a better uh, precision. So, this is comparing basically uh, a two transition, uh, you know, one is 2S and 2s to 4s, for example. Uh, because uh, 2s to 2p state is very broad. It's 100 megahertz. Uh, uh, so, so the line was uh, going to be uh, very broad. And it, uh, to, so it, we, we should be able to drive it with micro relatively a uh, straightforward way. So in, in the end, I think we're going to do both, uh, but then we'll, we'll have to see what, what comes out the best. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, 
in, I mean, in principle, I mean, you, you can start thinking about this. I mean, okay, with a one atom at a time, we couldn't think of something, anything like this. Like this. And with a thousand, uh, maybe, you know, sometimes they might interact. But I, I, I think the cross section is very small for, for the uh, uh, formation of molecule. However, uh, some other experiments are trying to uh, produce uh, an ion made of an uh, antiphoton and two positrons. So it's an uh, antimatter equivalent of a H minus ion. And so, so there, there's an effort uh, going on, separate effort going on to produce that. And it has some advantage. If you, a, a charged particle, charged ion is much easier to handle, manipulate than the neutral uh, atom. So, so, so that effort is going on. Yeah. And eventually, you know, not only just molecule, you know, we may be able to make a both unsigned condensate of, of anti-hydrogen and stuff like that, but that, that's a few years away. <laughs>